So let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for this night, um, that we can come together as a youth group and worship you. Lord, we thank you for the music that we already had and the good time of uh, games that we already had together. And Lord, we thank you for your word and this study in Genesis that you've uh, allowed us to participate in, where you speak to us through your word, Lord. And uh, we thank you for even giving us the Bible at all, Lord. We know it's totally by your grace that you have chosen to reveal who you are and what your will is. And Lord, we, uh, we pray that as we look at uh, Genesis in an overview tonight, that we will see Christ in it, Lord, and that uh, we'll be led to worship of him, and that uh, we'll be more fully sanctified by knowing who you are, Lord, and be able to apply that into our lives uh, directly through some ideas in the discipleship group time. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given us, and we pray that this night will be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you can open your Bibles if you want to what I'm calling now the Gospel of Genesis, so just the book of Genesis. Uh, I mean that Genesis really does have so many things in it that pertain to the Gospel uh, that it wouldn't be, I don't think it'd be possible to comb through it in a night. You could probably go for months talking about all the implications of the Gospel that are found in Genesis since it's such a foundational book of the Bible. But to read and understand what happened in Genesis is not enough for Christians. We don't just go and read and, and get a basic understanding of what went on during that time. It's essential to do that, but it's not sufficient. It's not enough. And what makes our understanding of the book of Genesis different than a conservative Jewish interpretation that would take the Old Testament uh, seriously that would take the Old Testament similarly to us in a lot of respects is that <coughs> we're Christians in the New Covenant so we always have a New Covenant focused <coughs> through Christ and the book, Bible is a book about God the Bible is a book about Christ and this is the key to uh, what we're going to talk about tonight it's that Christ is the key to the Old Testament to understanding the Old Testament you have to know Christ and uh, one verse that I like that hopefully we'll set our minds and our hearts for focusing on this tonight is just a small three-word statement from Colossians 3.11 that says, Christ is all. And we need to focus on that, that Christ is all. That's really what the book of Colossians is about. That's really what the book of Bible is about. uh, What the Bible is about. That's really what everything is about. It's all things pertain to Christ. All things are in relationship to who Jesus Christ is. And Colossians 1 also informs us, which we'll be reading a little bit later tonight, a little bit of it, is that all things are about Jesus Christ. And to look at Genesis in this context, in this mode of thinking, is the redemptive historical interpretation of the Old Testament, that we look at God's redeeming hand throughout history and saving his people and bringing about the Messiah in his sovereignty and those type of things. And to see Jesus in the Old Testament, we use what I call, and many of you have heard me say this before, we use what we call the Where's Waldo method. You have to, you see what Waldo looks like on the cover, you have to know what Waldo looks like, and then you go back through the picture, and you're able to search out and find where Waldo is. Well, that's how we look at Christ in the Old Testament. We have to know who Christ is, we have to know what Christ looks like, we have to know what Christ does and how Christ acts, and then we look at the Old Testament and we can see pictures and shadows of Christ even there. And so the New Testament has given us the answer key. You have uh, kind of in those, remember, if you remember Saxon math, how you had at the at back of your book, every, every odd number would have an answer to it, but the even would not, or something like that, and you'd get to the end and you're like, so you, you, you do the, the odd ones, of course, and try to do the even ones. Well, then you get the answer key, and that's what Christ is to the Old Testament. The New Testament is the answer key that helps us understand the old. And the old also, by the way, prepares us to understand the new. And so this is the new covenant. Everything's centered around Christ. Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty three, he didn't say we preach the gospel about Christ. He said we preach Christ and him crucified. And he also said in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, we are determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So it's not just a message about Christ. The gospel is a person, and so Christ is the message. 
And so the Old Testament cannot and should not be divorced from that. We have to understand that in a New Testament light. It, it doesn't stand on just an independent unit that we just look at and walk away from. We have to focus on it through our understanding of the New Testament, the New Covenant. And so in the Old Testament, we're promised the coming of a new covenant, which is fulfilled in Christ. So he is the key. So the same principles apply to our study in the book of Genesis. Now that's enough to say that, but this is actually the testimony of Scripture. This is, I had several of uh, New Testament references to how they viewed the Old Testament, but I'm just going to give a few. First of all, and probably the most important, is the testimony of Jesus about the Old Testament. Uh, after Jesus rose from the dead, he was walking along with some disciples on the road to Emmaus, and it's said that he explained or interpreted or exposited the scriptures to them. And Luke 24, 27 says, speaking of Jesus, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. <clears throat> of course, all the scriptures at that time are the Old Testament. Jesus goes back to Moses and shows them how all the Old Testament was ultimately pointing to him. Uh, the books of Moses refer to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And so Jesus exposited, gave the true interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures that had to do with him. And so as the perfect preacher, he's the one, only one actually, who has the right to Old T Testament interpretation. He's the one who is able to reveal the full meaning. He's made clear the things that were unclear, including in Genesis, even though it doesn't mention Genesis by name, Specifically, Jesus mentioned Genesis several times. Uh, he, he was the point. He makes the answer. He makes it all make sense. And so to say it another way, without knowing Jesus, the Old Testament can only be partially understood. It can be understood in terms of language and history and context and other normal tools of biblical interpretation. It's perfect in that form, but it can't be understood fully without understanding who Christ is, what Christ has done, and the role Christ played in the Old Testament. And so that's how we get biblical interpretation. The, the opposite is also true. To not know the Old Testament, if we refuse to look at the Old Testament, that means we only have a partial view of who Christ is, because if Christ can be known through the Old Testament, and all scripture is inspired, then by ignoring the Old Testament, we're really ignoring a fuller view of Christ because that groundwork is laid in the Old Testament. Jesus went on to say in Luke 24, 44 and 45, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you when I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. Every genre of scripture, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, which represents the poetic writings, were fulfilled in Christ. Every type of scripture genre. So Jesus is the perfect preacher. He opened the minds, and he still opens the minds to understand the scripture. And so he's our prophet. We think that we know that Jesus is our perfect prophet to teach us the spirit-inspired word. So Jesus' interpretation is the interpretation we should focus on. But it's also what the uh, apostles said when they found Jesus, when uh, Philip and Nathaniel were discussing that they had found the Messiah, they said in John 1.46, we found him of whom Moses wrote in the law, and the prophets also. And who is it? Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus gave, uh, Jesus further along in his ministry, actually back in his ministry because I was reading texts after the resurrection, he had an argument with the Jews over the Old Testament. He's in one of the most uh, heated discussions he had with the Pharisees in John 5 where Jesus had claimed to be God. Uh, he, has a, he has a discussion about how he has proven to be God and the unwillingness of the Jews to believe in him. In John 5.39, uh, through 40, he says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. Jesus, defending his deity, defending the truth of scripture to the Jews in the, some of the most powerful chapters of the Bible, he provided perfect proof uh, 
and revealed their unwillingness to believe the truth even when faced with it. And that's the plight of every sin- sinner, is that we will not accept the truth even when we see the truth in front of our face. Jesus was referring to the Old Testament, uh, the only Bible that Jesus only ha- ever had, the only Bible the apostles ever had, uh, was the Old Testament. And he was confronted, he was confronting the religious hypocrisy of the Jews who looked at the scriptures, who made a life out of studying the scriptures so much and focusing on all the details of the scriptures and being able to quote the scriptures and immerse their lives in the Bible. And he's saying, look, if you really believe the Bible, you would believe the Father's testimony concerning the Son because the Father is the one who gave the Old Testament. And my only conclusion is that if you don't believe in me, then you really don't believe the words of Moses because Moses wrote about me. And that's what Jesus' whole point is. He, and Jesus even went so far as to say in John 5.45 that it was not going to be him, it was not going to be Jesus who would condemn those people before the Father. The person who was going to condemn them before the Father for their unbelief was going to be Moses because they were not going to believe Moses' writings, Moses who they claimed to hold so fastidiously to, Moses who they loved and revered. He's saying, look, Moses is going to condemn you because you didn't believe what he wrote, because he wrote about Christ. John 5, 46 through 47, this is Jesus' words in that context. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings... How will you believe my words? Notice that connection there between his writings and my words. That if you believe the Old Testament, you will believe the words of Christ. And so Moses wrote about Christ. And Jesus, even in the uh, parable, he told about Lazarus uh, and the rich man and Lazarus dying and going to heaven and the rich man dying and going to hell. And Jesus describing that. At the end of that parable, Lazarus asks Jesus to send him back or send... Uh, not Lazarus, the rich man asks uh, Abraham to send Lazarus back and warn his brothers, saying, you know, okay, this is, this is what you're going to face if you don't repent. And the conclusion was that Abraham says is they have the law and the prophets. If they're unwilling to believe be- with the law and the prophets, they won't believe it even if someone r- it was raised from the dead. And eventually that happened. Jesus was raised from the dead and it didn't matter because of unwillingness to believe. So Jesus' assertion of the Old Testament, including Genesis, pointed to him. And that, that also goes on through New Testament writers. I'm, also, I'm just going to focus on a few things from what Paul had to say about the same subject. So Paul writes that the Old Testament is, law is a tutor to bring us to Christ. We'll talk about that more uh, in, a, in more detail in a minute. But in other words, the Old Testament lays the crucial groundwork and foundation for knowing Christ, especially for the Jews, since that's who the Old Testament is primarily for. But in the gospel, not the gospel, in the epistle of Romans that's all about unfolding the gospel, (coughs) Paul writes this, Romans 1 1 through 3, in the introduction, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now he's talking about the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son. So Paul is saying the gospel of God was proclaimed through the prophets and it was proclaimed in the Old Testament Scriptures pointing ahead to the Son. And the gospel that Paul is going to unfold in Romans is the same gospel that was looked forward to in the Old Testament. This gospel of God was promised beforehand through the prophets. The Old Testament scripture pointed forward to the Son. Uh, And then 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, verses that we probably know well, have some of it memorized maybe. Uh, Paul's writing Timothy, who had been raised uh, as a Jew, understanding the scriptures. And he says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, that's the Old Testament, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation. Now, Paul's assumption there is that the Old Testament scriptures give wisdom that will lead to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say all scripture is inspired by God and continues through there to talk about the attributes of scripture. 
the Old Testament scriptures make salvation in Christ <coughs> the only logical conclusion. Uh, so if the Old Testament scriptures are truly believed, then the obvious answer to them is Christ. And then Paul goes on to say, all scripture, meaning Genesis included, is profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It's sufficient to lead to salvation. So it has the foundation laying aspect to it. Galatians 3.24, which I already made mention of, says, therefore the law, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we would be justified by faith. So the law is made to lead people to Christ as the role of a tutor. It's a it's a role that brings someone <coughs> to someone else. It's ultimately leading to something else. So that we would know that justification by faith through Christ was always the plan of God throughout all of redemptive history. And so the theme of the whole Bible, God working out his plan of salvation, doing what he had promised to do in the Garden of Eden, is the theme of Scripture. Genesis has been called the seed plot of the Bible. And A.W. Pink, who is the writer of uh, the book some of you may have read called The Attributes of God, he says that almost all great doctrines become fully developed in Genesis, that are uh, become fully developed in the rest of the Bible, are found in Genesis in germ form, meaning in seed form. They, like a tree is grown out of a seed, all those seeds are found in Genesis. And so the seeds of all Bible doctrines are planted in Genesis and grow through the rest of the Bible. Uh, Henry Morris wrote, No other book of the Bible is quoted as copiously or referred to so frequently in other books of the Bible as is Genesis. So Genesis is a crucial book to understand. Uh, and just as a word of warning, word of caution, as a reminder, the goal is not to go through and unturn every rock and see Christ in places where he obviously isn't and to make assumptions that scripture does not lead to that conclusion. The point is that the New Testament is just the interpreter of the Old. So we focus on, old te on New Testament interpretation instead of making up things. You don't go into some weird idea that... Um, the stone is in this chapter is Christ, and he and this represents Israel. And that you just take what the New Testament says about the Old Testament, and you can get plenty from there without stretching the text. Uh, so we'll stick to those connections. And just as a, and uh, just as a quote to kind of get our minds focused on this, uh, written by a man named Henry Law, who wrote a track called "The Gospel in Genesis." wrote, the object of these pages, and this is the, kind of the simple, uh, this is kind of the same uh, thing I wanted to do here. The object of these pages is simple, clear, holy. It is to arouse attention to the blessed truth that Christ pervades all scripture. As salt, all the waters of the sea, as light, the brightest day, as fragrance, the garden of choice flowers. So we may not, we don't look back and, and see Christ in a fully direct way in Genesis. But, at, like we know that ocean water is salty, we know that Christ is present in the Old Testament. And he went on to write as a prayer for his readers, May the unfolding spirit help each reader glean more from the golden field of Scripture, and may the Pentateuch, first five books, be a boundless treasury of Christ. And so that's how we're going to focus in on tonight. In just the remaining time, we're just going to pull out a few things of focus on scripture uh, itself and go from there and just see where, where's the gospel, where's Christ in scripture. Uh, the first thing we are going to look at is, we're just going to look at a few things from Genesis 1. Uh, first thing we're going to look at is um, the concept of before the foundations of the world. So the first, very first words in the Bible, in the beginning God, and A.W. Pink has written, and I'll try to paraphrase him, that God is solitary. That God, there was a time, even though time would not be the right way to express that concept, there was a time when God existed with nothing, in need of nothing, totally self-sufficient, totally on his own, within, totally self-satisfied within the Trinity, with himself, needing nothing. Humans were not necessary to God. God did not create humans because he was necessary. And God existed in that time for all of eternity past. 
And even before we get to the first words of Genesis, we read in other places of the Bible uh, this phrase a lot, before the foundations of the world. And so this is the doctrine of God's absolute foreknowledge, election, and sovereignty in choosing his people for salvation. Ephesians 1.4 uh, writes, Just as he chose us in him, that is Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. It was God's absolute sovereignty over salvation. The plan was accomplished by God before anything was created. We know Genesis as the book of creation, and we know that God was there with the plan worked out in his mind of salvation for his chosen people before anything was created. The gospel was secured by his sovereignty and power before creation. Uh, Jesus said, those blessed of the Father to repent and believe in Jesus for salvation. Jesus speaks in Matthew 25, 34 of the kingdom prepared for them before the foundation of the world. So all that God is going to bring to himself had that uh, privilege put upon them by God's grace before God created anything. Jesus said that he was going to make clear things that had not been made clear since the foundation of the world. Jesus, when he prayed to the Father on the night before he was crucified, asked the Father to glorify him with the same glory Jesus possessed with him before the world began in John 17.5. So we see that Jesus is present before creation. And Jesus also went on in that same prayer to say that he desired that his people would be with him so that they would see his glory, glory that he possessed with the Father from before the foundation of the world, John 17.24. So we see that God's works here, in a sense, in the way that we can look at them, are finished. That God had already made the plan work in his sovereignty before any creation happened. Hebrews 4.3 says, God's plans are finished before the foundation of the world. Jesus was foreknown by the Father, meaning had an intimate relationship with the Father in his, um, even in his context as the Savior of the world before the foundation of the world. Most importantly, perhaps, for our understanding of the gospel is this verse, is Revelation 13.8. Now, we know Jesus as the Lamb of God, crucified for the sins of the world, but Revelation 13.8, I'm going to read it in the King James uh, Version because this is, I think this is the uh, best expression of this verse in that version. And they that dwell on the earth shall worship him, and that him there is not Jesus, it's referring to the Antichrist, and it says, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And even though Jesus stepped into actual history to pay for sins with his death before the Father, it was foreordained and predestined by the foreknowledge of God in eternity past. God's plan was that the gospel would bring glory to the praise of his grace and was planned and, in the mind of God, a done deal before creation. And so God actually set it into motion in history so that, and sovereignly brought about all things that come to pass so that we would not just know God the creator, but that we would know God the redeemer as well. And so God is so utterly sovereign and powerful that as he speaks things, they happen no matter what. And nothing turns God aside from his plan because they're determined by his sovereign will. Uh, and so the next thing we're going to look at is creation and Christ. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. From the very first verse of the Bible, and the very first uh, we read of Christ, in a very similar language to Genesis 1.1, we also rem remember a very important in the beginning statement later in the Bible. In the very famous Gospel of John, we read John 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we see that the word, Christ, was in the beginning with the Father 
that he was the one who was there creating all things in Genesis 1.1. And so John, as the gospel that kind of puts the rest of the gospels into context, quotes Genesis and reminds people, reminds its readers to go back to Genesis and focus and saying, remember in the beginning, well, let me tell you what also is true about in the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and and then he goes to reveal the gospel of Jesus all throughout John. And so the word was already there. He was with God and also was God. The second person of the Trinity, who we would come to know as the man Jesus Christ, was in the beginning with God. Not only was he there, but everything that exists came into existence through him, and nothing that exists did not come into existence through him. So there's kind of that double statement of truth there, that everything that came into being, everything that had a beginning, everything that exists, exists through this person, Jesus Christ, who is the Word and eternal God. And so if anything exists, it means that it was created by and through Christ. So he was there in creation. He created everything. He had no beginning and no end. He eternally existed. He could not have been created since all things that were created came into being through him. And we also read that in him was life. Not just he was given life, but that in him was life, meaning uh, that only God has the attribute of life. Only God can give life. Only God exercises independent ownership of life. And the life was the light of men. So the gospel begins with the very beginning of creation, and even before that, to talk about the Savior that existed. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 18, speaking about Christ, and Colossians is a gospel about the preeminence of Christ, says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself might have first place in everything. So the reason that the gospel matters is because the one who made all and owns all also paid with his own blood for his people, the church. Acts 20, 28 says that God purchased the church with his own blood. And so it's not that Jesus' blood was just sufficient to buy you and pay for your sins. It's that Jesus' blood as the creator is worth more than absolutely everything. So that's why the gospel matters. That's why Jesus' blood has power. That's why it has meaning because Jesus' blood is sufficient to purchase everything because he is the owner and creator of it. All things were created by him. All things were created in him. All things were created through him and all things were created for him. So he's getting the glory. He's the one creating it. He's the one participating in all aspects of it. And he stands as preeminent before all things. He's the, that's why it calls him the first, not that he was the firstborn of creation like he was the first thing that God created and then through him created everything else, as the Jehovah's Witnesses would say, but that Christ is the preeminent one, the creator, the one through whom everything was created. Revelation 3.14 says that he's the beginning of the creation of God, which means that Jesus is the beginning. He's the beginner. He's the origin or the source. He's the also the preeminent one. He's not the first one who ra- was raised from the dead, but he's the most important one. So he's the firstborn raised through the, from the dead, and he holds first place in everything. And so the point, of Genes- the point of Genesis is true, but the point of Colossians is that Jesus is everything. He is creator. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 also makes the same point. Yes, for, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. So we see that aspect of the Father, and we would understand and agree with that. But it goes on to say, and one Lord... Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. So there's a unity between the persons of the Godhead, uh, but also a diversity that we can see in them. And so the God that we worship is the Father who created all things, and we exist for him, and he created us for himself, and the one who we also worship is the Lord Jesus Christ, and by him all things were created, and we exist for him.
and we exist through him. So he's the source of the power. He's the one who created in the beginning. He's the one through whom God made all things. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 also said God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. So we read there of Christ that God has spoken in many ways throughout the Old Testament and his final revelation ultimately is in the person of Christ, his son, who is the heir of all things, and God through him created the world. Jesus was the power by which God created the world. Jesus is also the radiance of God's glory and the perfect imprint of God's nature and upholds all things by his power. So Jesus is totally sovereign there. And it's interesting uh, reading a passage like Proverbs 8 uh, that speaks anthropomorphically about wisdom, meaning it, gives a, it, it talks about wisdom as a person and speaks about wisdom. Many people look back at Proverbs 8, uh, or many people have throughout history, and look at it as, as some of the things being mentioned about wisdom as referring to Christ in the beginning. Because it speaks about wisdom, it says the Lord possessed, it, it, this, I'm not quoting this, I'll read a little bit of it in a minute, but it says the Lord possessed wisdom in the beginning of his ways before his works of old. Wisdom was established from everlasting, from the beginning, the earliest times of the earth, wisdom was there, that's Proverbs 8, 22 through 24. And I'll read Proverbs 8, 30 and 31. And, and then it speaks of wisdom takes over the conversation and says, Then I was there beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth. Now we can debate about that interpretation of Proverbs 8, but we know that Christ is the wisdom of God, that Christ was there as the creator with God, and that uh, uh Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30 that to those of us who being saved, Christ is the wisdom and power of God and that all uh, treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in him, Colossians 2, 3. So Jesus is totally God in every way and was there in Genesis. However, we read the sad truth of the sinful world that Jesus entered into, uh, John 1, 10. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So th that was the conclusion that the world had about its creator, that it did not come to know its creator because of human sinfulness and unwillingness to believe. And even though Jesus is the creator, he's the one by whom and through whom and for whom all things exist, he was rejected by the world that he made and his own people. And so, uh, so Christ is rejected uh, even though the world is his property, his uh, rightful ownership. Uh, but we also read that in Hebrews that believing that the world is created by God is a matter of faith. That does not mean that it is uh, a matter of believing something that we know isn't true. It's that we believe in the uh, word of God. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. And if we understand also that the, word, that the world was made by the word of Christ, we see clearly that Christ is God. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. The world was created out of nothing. And so the next point is creation and salvation. So we see that Christ was there. We see that God was working from before the foundation of the world towards salvation, towards the redemption of his people. But we also see, cre we also see the gospel in the very act of creation. Faith begins where the Bible begins, and it begins with creation. God made the world ex nihilo. He made it out of nothing. And so if the, I won't get too into this, but if, since matter, what everything is made out of, can change, we know that matter is not eternal. Matter had to have a beginning, and it had to come out, it had to eventually, originally be created, which only God can do. So if Christ existed and created it, that means that Christ is God. But the original creation points forward to the gospel. In the same way God created something out of nothing originally in creation, we read that he is the one, quoting Romans 4.17, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. 
in the gospel, that's what God does. When God saves an individual, he is not just changing some things around about their life. He's not putting them in a 12-step program. He's not just reworking some things that into a new form. There, there is no possibility in people to be worked into salvation. You cannot produce uh, the new birth. Creation, God creating something out of nothing, points forward to salvation. Uh, Thomas Watson said, A man has no more power to change himself than to create himself. We do not exist First and foremost, we did not come into existence. We were not born by our own will. We did not bring ourselves about. We did not decide that we were going to be born. God created us. God was the one who created the, in the beginning. God was the one who, who created everything. And in the same way, in the gospel, God is the only one who can create a new person. And as much as, uh, and so we read that the first creation really has to do, uh, really points forward in a way, and is a powerful example of the second creation or recreation. And think about uh, a phrase that maybe we haven't thought about in this way before. In when David wrote his psalm of repentance after his sin with Bathsheba, the famous psalm, Psalm 51, he did not ask God just to adjust, help him adjust his attitude. What he said to God in Psalm 51.10, not just, God, if you could just tweak my heart a little bit so that it'll be right with you. He says in Psalm 51.10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Meaning, this is not something that we have the power or the resources or the ability to bring about in ourselves. It has to be something independent of us, created in us which only God can do. We have to have a new heart created in us. And the Bible affirms this. It says, before Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So being dead not only mean in trespasses and sins means that not only can we not do anything about it, but we don't even know we're dead, just like a dead person doesn't know that they're dead. So we have no chance of helping ourselves. You don't get up and, okay, you've got a dead person here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the... Uh, I'm going to, you've got a skeleton on the ground, you're not going to take out the defibrillator and, and get the skeleton going. You're not going to get a dead person and say, okay, if you could just, just walk 10 feet to the hospital, it, does, it might as well be 100 miles. The, the dead person is not going anywhere. And that's our spiritual position before we're saved. Hump, Humpty Dumpty's not going to put himself together. Uh, to, to be undead, to make ourselves undead, to raise ourselves to life would be to unscramble an egg. It's not possible. So the outward act of creation of a new person has to come from God. And so that points back to the example in Genesis. So we have the example of creation in Genesis that God was able to create all things. And that points forward to new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 in the New King James Version says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Paul also wrote that the controversy over circumcision and uncircumcision in the Galatian church was not the issue. That was not the way to be saved. That circumcision wasn't anything and neither was uncircumcision. The point was a new creation in Galatians 6.15. We are, to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again, John 3.3 3 and 3.5. 3, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. Well, how much control did we have over our first birth? Zero. How much control could we possibly have over our second birth? Zero. It's a total act of God's sovereign grace where he creates a new person and a heart that is sensitive to understand the things of God. And so by God's grace, we're saved through the gift of faith. God gives grace. He also gives faith. He also grants repentance. And think of, uh, we know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but think of Ephesians 2, 2, 10. It says that, you know, we're, we're in God. We're supposed to, we're... Uh, do good works. Okay, that's where the good works aspect comes in. But think about it, what it actually says. It says that we are a creation created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand. So we are created into that position. So works is totally taken out of the equation when we remember what creation is and how it points to the gospel. Creation is an event in itself, but it also points ahead to the ultimate uh, spiritual recreation in the gospel.
And uh, lastly, I'm just going to talk about for a minute creation and light. Uh, one of the, fir- the first time that we read God speaking in the Bible, uh, actually speaking the words, we read in Genesis 1-3 that God said, let there be light, and there was light. God created the world, and he created light. And so every time we, should, we see light, I'm going to say that every time we see the example of light, it should point our minds back to the gospel. Uh, because we're told of the significance of light throughout scripture. It says that God is light, in him is no darkness at all. And if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with his son. John 1, 5 and verse 7. And so God is light. That's a, that's a significant statement. There are only a few God is statements in the Bible. So not only did God provide and create light in the real sense that God created light, God created the sun, that we enjoy light now, that we can see each other, but that he also created spiritual light through Christ. Remember that we read earlier that in him, in Jesus, was life and the life was the light of men and darkness could not overcome it uh, because it could not overcome the power of light, John 1, 4, and 5. He's the true light which enlightens every man, John 1, 9. And Jesus said himself, John 8, 12, he stood up before the people on, in Jerusalem on the feast of Hanukkah and the light had just gone out from this giant menorah and he stood up and proclaimed to the people, I am the light of the world. Now think of what Jesus, that's an I am statement, which means he's claiming to be God, but he's also saying he is the light of the world. And so that points back to original light. We couldn't understand. There's something about light that reveals, uh, that that gives us a fuller picture of who Christ is. And everyone who believes in him will not walk in darkness, uh, John 12, 46. Christ entered the world as light. Men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. But those who practice the truth come to the light, John 3, 19 and 20. And Jesus not only came in as light, not only to provide light, but he came in to get children of light, which refers to believers who were in darkness. Darkness represents throughout scripture a spiritual state of deadness, having nothing to do with God, and Christ comes in as the light of the world. Uh, The Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light, Colossians 1.12, and that God has called us to out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2.9. And it's, it's kind of cool that in the, uh, oh, it's not just kind of cool, but that's why I'm going to describe it. In the original creation, God created light. He created the sun. We, we need the sun to exist. But in Revelation, we read that there won't be a sun because the Lord God will be our light. So that, uh, that's, what, that's what we're headed towards. Uh, the most significant verse that, uh, that has to do with the gospel quotes Genesis 1-3 uh, that I'm going to read. First, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 4 and verse 6. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, now listen to this. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So we're all blinded by sin. The light that's in us is darkness. Light has to come from an outside source. Light cannot be changed. You can't, you can't work darkness up into light. You can't rearrange the particles of darkness and get light as a result. There, the option is not available no matter what you do with it. And so our minds are blind because of unwillingness to believe the world system of Satan is blinding. Uh, but in the same way, this is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. In the same way that God said, let there be light, and there was light in the original creation, God speaks similarly to darkened hearts and says, light shall shine out of darkness, and that is the light that reveals the, face, that reveals the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. It says in Matthew 4.16, And in the land of a shadow, a light dawned. Uh, The fact is, it is not that Jesus bears some resemblance to the concept of light. It's not that, oh, well, Jesus is kind of like light. It's that 
rather light is a little bit like Christ. That when we look at light, we can see something of who Christ is and be reminded of that. And so light was given not only for its own sake. We have its own purposes for light. There are several things that light is used for. But light is also given to point to the gospel and to point to Christ. Uh, And so the point of this, just this, I mean, this just short examination of all that we could look at in Genesis, just this sample, is just to demonstrate that Christ is the point of the whole Bible, that that's what we need to focus on, and that we can look back to Genesis and see that Jesus Christ is there from the very first verse. All right, let's close in prayer, and then we're going to do a kind of collective small group together. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your gospel that you have... uh, that you have saved your people, that you have provided a way to save your people from before the foundation of the world through the Lamb who was crucified before the foundation of the world, Lord, that you have uh, created in us a new heart, Lord, that you have given us what we could not produce in ourselves, that we can never produce in ourselves, Lord, and that you have enlightened our eyes and our minds to uh, know Christ, Lord. And we thank you for the blessing that it, that is, Lord. I pray if anyone here does not know Christ, Lord, that you will uh, that you will create a clean heart in them, that you will uh, shine light of Christ into their hearts, Lord, and that they will be saved uh, by the grace of your Spirit. Lord, we pray for this time of uh, our discipleship group that we'll just have a good time talking to each other of how we can work this out, how we can worship you more fully, Lord, and uh, how we can just prepare to live lives that more honor you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.